think I'm in another hotel, and I run slap into the door because I'm cl- Well, let me say this. I'm not really clumsy. Things just get in my way, okay? <laughs> and so as a result of that, I, I have a tendency to not know where I'm at about half the time. So I really enjoyed what Mark talked about, and I really enjoyed about his, his passion And I, too, believe in passion. And so I'm going to kind of give you just a short background of my story and then get into what makes me passionate about what I do. Uh, I grew up in a very, very small town in Louisiana. And so I should pause there and go ahead and give you a disclaimer. I was speaking several years ago to about 500 people and uh, in a meeting similar to this. And so... A lady comes up to me afterward, and she said, "Um, very good speech, but she said, and I knew there was a but coming here. And so she said, but, and I knew where she was going with this but. She said, but your, your English and your grammar is not always perfect in what you're saying. And I knew then she was a school teacher because she said, and I'm a school teacher. And I said, well, I really appreciate that, but I said, and here comes my disclaimer, and this is what I told her. I said, if you're here for an English lesson, I am sorry. I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm from a little bitty town in Louisiana that the height of our population was 500 people. We never grew above 500 people. I did get to go to a high school that was up the road, uh, in another parish, and, and it, we actually had 100 people in school. And so with that being said, uh, I, I apologize for the lack of English and grammar, but I will say this. My speech is usually like the preamble to the Constitution. The Constitution is the letter of the law. The preamble is the spirit of the law. And so I hope today that you're getting something that will provoke your thinking, not necessarily something I say specifically, but if your mind is open, I promise you, your thoughts will be provoked and you will take your businesses to the next level. There is no question about that. So back to my story before I get into that, I grew up in this little small town in Louisiana and not really knowing what I wanted to do in life, I graduated high school finally after quitting school in the 11th grade. I finally went back because I was only making $40 a week at the grocery store, and back in those days they didn't check IDs to drink, so I was drinking $60 a week and and, and only had 40 to spend, so I decided I better go back to school. So I went back to school and graduated high school, so I worked in the oil field for about a year, Uh, That wasn't my thing. I worked in uh, moving trailer houses and worked in the local sawmill and did some things like that. So one day I just decided, well, I need to do something with my life. So I went in the military. And so spent five years in the military. I won't bore you with all of those details, but had a great military career during those five years and had the chance to work with Secret Service. And when Mark showed Air Force One earlier, I've been on Air Force One. I've been personal security for Casper Weinberger when he was Secretary of Defense. And so I had a really good career in the military, so I got out to go in the Secret Service. And so when I, when I got out to go in the Secret Service, I was waiting on the appointment from the federal government. I'd gotten a couple of offers, but I was waiting on that one for the Secret Service. Well, we had two babies and one on the way. And so a friend of mine asked me had I ever considered the insurance slash funeral business. And I said, who thinks about the insurance business and who thinks about the funeral business, you know? And so he said, well, just try it. So I went and got an insurance license. And then after the insurance license, I, I uh, went to work at a local funeral home. And I mean, it's exciting getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning, picking up bodies and, uh, and bringing them back to the, to the funeral home and helping dress them and helping prepare and doing all. I mean, it's exciting. I mean, just, whoo, you talk about passion, baby. <laughs> whoo, yes. And, uh, I mean, I just couldn't wait, you know. I mean, it's like sometimes when I'm speaking and I'm speaking on passion or on that subject, and I'll, ask, I'll, I'll pick out a married couple and I'll say, how long have you been married? And, and they'll say 50 or 60 years, you know, and I say, ooh, does she get up every morning and just turn cartwheels across the floors? Woo! I'm married to him. 
The answer is no. <laughs> but sometimes passion just runs deep. So I promise you I wasn't excited about 3 o'clock in the morning bodies. But over a short period of time, I fell in love with people. I fell in love with the industry that we serve. And I fell in love with what we do with those people that we serve. In fact, I, I see it as my obligation now. You ought to see me in a hotel bar. When I'm sitting there having a cocktail and somebody says, what do you do for a living? And I smile and I say, I'm in the death care business. <laughs> and, you know, most people in the death care business look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. You know, <laughs> versus really being excited about what we do, you know. And, and I say, I'm really that excited. I told Don last night, if I walked away from the company that I'm with now, I don't care about the size of it. That means nothing to me. What means something is the people that we serve. And if I had to walk away today because my company lost that passion, I would walk away today and probably be at one of your doors wanting to know if I could get a job. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it is about the people we serve. And so, with that being said, I think we all know that in our industry, times are changing. There's no question about that. We're seeing things move in a different direction, and we're seeing it faster than ever before. This is my 33rd year in this business. 30 years ago, I left the funeral home that I was in because I seen the changes coming, and nobody would believe it. Because it was much like in the old days where people just thought it would always be the same. We'll have us four and no more. We have our market share and you have your market share and this person has their market share, but and nothing will ever change or at least in a big way. And I want you to think about this just a moment and I'll say it again in, a little bit later. In our industry, we are trained to be reactive and not proactive. I mean, we're waiting on people to die. How much more reactive can you get than waiting on somebody to die, you know? And so we're quite often not forward thinking. I'm not saying all of you are that way. I'm speaking of the industry as a whole. But we're quite often not forward thinking or trying to visualize or see what's going to be happening down the road. But we all can agree now that change is not only coming, change is here. And I want you to think about this little scenario for a moment, and many of you may have heard this story or seen this before, but let's say that I took boiling water, and I had it on the stove, and in that boiling water I put some carrots in there. What would boiling water do to a hard carrot? It would soften it, right? If I took the same boiling water and I put an egg in there, it would harden the egg. But if I took the same boiling water and I put coffee grounds in there, and I did grow up in that little small town where we still put the grounds in the water and then we shook the pot up to stir it up and drank it while, while it was doing it and still stirred the cup. I still stir my cup at the end of the day. I don't know why. But used to it was because of the grounds. But if you put the grounds in that boiling water, what happens? The grounds changes the water. Now, the water changed the carrot. The water changed the egg. But the coffee grounds actually changed the water itself. And so, in our industry, we know that there's one thing that will never change. And that is that people are going to die. We know that's going to happen. People tell me all the time, when I tell them I'm in the death care business, they, they say, well, you've got a job for life. Well, maybe, maybe not with things that are going on. But with that being said, we know that that will never change. But what does change is the people that are dying. The fact that they're going to die doesn't change, but they do change. We live in a different world than we ever have been. I'm at the very end of the baby boomer generation. And I think different than those who were years ahead of me in the same generation, 
and I certainly think different than those that I'm ahead of in my lifetime. And I'm one of those that I really don't like change. I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm going to talk more about that as we go on. I really don't like it at all. But I, but I understand that it's inevitable. I understand that it's going to happen. So if there's some things, so before I put anybody to sleep today, and before you get too far off on, on, on the mill, let me just share with you a few quick things that I hope you get from this today, and then I'll move on and, and begin to move through it. The first thing that I hope that you get today is that people are more knowledgeable than ever before. I'm going to highlight that in just a little while. There's a lot of reasons for it, and we'll talk about some of those. Number two, that change is inevitable. It's going to happen. It doesn't matter how much we resist it. You know, there was a time in my life that I literally said, I'm never going to have a computer on my desk, and I have one in my pocket now. You know, I mean, I really said that. There was a time in my life when I thought it was exciting when I was out selling pre-need, and I thought it was exciting when they went away from just the tall pay phones to the ones you could pull your car up to and stretch it out to, to talk on the phone sitting in your car. I thought, wow, this is huge. I'm sitting in my car on the phone. Some of us are sitting in the bathroom on the phone. Some of us are sitting, you know, in the hallway on the phone. We're sitting in our offices on the phone. we got a phone with us everywhere. I've got one here, too. I thought I was going to be one of those that it just wasn't going to affect. The chair, I, and then I thought, there's no way I'm going to get on the Internet. I mean, that ain't happening. Now it ain't happening unless we are on the Internet. So pardon my country English there. It ain't happening. <laughs> but anyway... So change is inevitable. Number three, though, and this one is very important for today, and that is that change needs leadership. We need people to lead change, not follow change. Because I will say this again in just a little while, but we are at the greatest point in our history in our industry, the greatest time ever where we can fail or whether we can succeed. We are at that pivoting point. Some of us are okay with, with failing. Some of us are okay with not growing. Some of us are okay with thinking change will never come. But if change came to rural Louisiana, rural Mississippi, I live in Dallas, Texas now, and if change comes to those little places in the world, it comes to Minnesota too. And it comes everywhere. And I speak all over the country, and I'm consulting all over the country, and I work with thousands of funeral directors across the country. As Don mentioned, I, I worked for a family-owned business for a long time after I left my first funeral home that we had uh, 13 funeral homes. We had a monument company with 53 retail outlet locations across about six or eight states in the south. And then we had, but we also owned part of a quarry in Elberton, Georgia. And then we, we had an insurance company. So I've worked in this business along with cemeteries, which we owned as well. So, and no, I, I don't work for SCI. Somebody asked me that earlier. I do not. And uh, we did sell our funeral homes. And eventually I became the national marketing director for a company. And then we turned around and bought my other company. And then over time, uh, we've just built a business, and we will end this year at about $3 billion uh, strong. But none of that is impressive to me, because what is impressive to me is the fact that we are still serving a people who has basic needs that we can impact. But because times are changing, we've got to take the lead and have leadership in finding ways to reach out to those people and meet them where they're at, and then take them to where they want to go. I'm going to ask you a question, and this is not going to require you to respond to me, but think about it in your mind. Would we rather educate? Would we rather lead? Would we rather develop? Would we rather take people to the places that they choose and want to go because of our experience and because of our knowledge and because of our understanding? 
or would we rather let a sign or a billboard or something they see on TV direct their futures? Because people see these things and they think that they have enough knowledge out there to make decisions. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. But what they do lack is our experience in this industry. They do lack that in a large way. So we need leadership. That's really one of the biggest things I want you to get out of that. And then I want you to get out of this is that pre-need is a way to actually bring leadership to the table. I've been doing this a long time. And I can tell you in today's world, it is more impactful in our industry than it ever has been. And for those naysayers who say that people are not interested, I will tell you up front, it is not that the people aren't interested, it's those of us who are supposed to be leaders who are not interested. If we as leaders had an interest in the needs of people, I will assure you, or the needs, this specific need that people have, I will assure you that we would sell more pre-need and meet more needs with families than we could ever imagine. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. But I did mention that people are very educated today. They're educated by this creature called Google. And this creature lives in this dark place, strange dark place, called the Internet. And so today, in today's world, you can Google anything. Google funerals, Google cremations, Google monuments, Google cemeteries, and all kind of things come up. And so what they're doing in today's world is, is they're educating themselves, and I'm going to be honest about this, and there's a lot of reasons why they're doing it. One of the reasons that they're doing it is because they really, in many ways, and so many mindsets, don't want advice. We think that we can know it on our own. But there's another reason and a larger reason why. And it's because we who are educators in our industry have failed to educate. We do seminars all over the country, and, and, and we can't house, uh, house enough people for them. I can go into a city for a funeral home and actually advertise a seminar for a funeral home on pre-arrangement and and we can't get enough we can't we can get so we get so many people responding that we don't have enough room in some of the buildings that we use i'm telling you people are interested in knowing what we know they're interested in growing they're interested in learning they're interested in finding things out yes they want to think for themselves I remember a couple of years ago, I had been at uh, uh, one of these fair type things, gun shows or something like that, and so I knew we didn't have an alarm system in our house, and so I signed up for the alarm guy. Well, I knew what was going to happen. What you know, what's going to happen? He's going to he's going to sit. He's going to call me, right? Oh, I won this, which I you know I, I remember what I won. I think I won the right for him to come out or something like that. <laughs> but anyway, I won something. So, so anyway, he comes out to my house, and, and so within just a short period of time, he figures out that I'm a salesperson. He figures out that I've been successful at sales, and so he gets nervous. He's pretty new at it, so he gets nervous. And so he all of a sudden jumps from his presentation into showing me uh, what the final product was, and he laid out three choices on the table. And I stopped him, and I said, I appreciate you giving me the right to make my own decision. I said, thank you for that. But I said, I also would appreciate it if you understood that while I'm in sales, I'm not in alarm sales. You're the expert in the alarm sales. And so I need you to educate me on this a little bit further before I can make an educated decision. You see, I'm in agreement with people wanting to make an educated decision. I'm in agreement with people wanting to make their own decisions. But I'm also of the understanding that many times, because of this creature called Google who lives in a dark place called the Internet, 
I'm convinced that they're not making informed and educated decisions. I'm convinced that they're making decisions based on somebody's opinion. My daughter, who's 36 years old, is buying a new home. And so the other day, uh, we were looking at flooring for the home. So she's on Google on one end of the house, and I'm in, on Google on the other end of the house, and we both found two different opinions about what type of flooring should be. And so what's happening is, is people are getting some information. I'm not opposed to Google. I use it too. In fact, I can remember one of my assistants walking in my office a couple of years ago, and I had a dictionary, I don't know if y'all remember what that is, uh, laying on my desk, and she looked at me and she said, whoa, she said, I haven't seen one of those in years. <laughs> I said, well, how do you get your information, and, and how do you get words spelled? She said, I Google it. So now I'm Googling for words, you know, <laughs> and so I'm not totally opposed to Google, that's not my point. It's just that the information that we get is sometimes opinionated and not factual, and it's not all the facts, at least, that we need to make informative decisions. So we in our industry have been trained to deal with the emotional. Whether you're in the cemetery business, the monument business, whether you're in the funeral business, we have been trained as professionals to deal with an emotional situation. Somebody has died. There's nothing more emotional than that. In fact, I can tell you that there are people in our industry that have had people pass away that they loved that honestly sat in front of that funeral director and had no idea what to do because of the impact on them. So we have been trained to deal with the, the emotional. We've been trained to deal with death. We've been trained to deal with after death. And, and yet people are being educated from a, a non-emotional standpoint. They found a way to take the emotion out of it. And so then here we are having to respond in, in to a non-emotional situation, and yet we're used to only approaching it from an emotional standpoint. And, and the important thing about that for all of us is, is that not only do we have to embrace that change, not only do we have to understand that it's there, but we have to find a way to lead it because I am totally convinced 100% that what people are lacking when they're in the new wave of knowledge is they're lacking experience. If I was wanting to overcome drugs today, do you think that I would go to someone who had never understood how to overcome drugs? Or if I wanted to overcome anything in my life or counsel with anyone in my life, I would go to someone who understood what I was talking about because I want the best advice that I could possibly get. And I'm convinced that people do too, but because we are in a reactive world, we have set back and let that happen, and the only thing we've done in many cases is complain about it. We have sat back and said, this is happening, this is the way people are today, and I quite often, and I agree with that, I, I do the same thing. But quite often in those conversations, my question for people is, is what are we doing about it? What are we doing to change it? What are we doing to shape it? What are we doing to educate people? I can, I can give you an example of one of our top agents in one of our top funeral homes today. His average cremation sells between $4,500 and $8,000. And, and that's a cremation cell, not a traditional funeral. Why is that? Because he took the approach that I am going to educate my families, and he's so firm about it that, that they listen to him, that I'm going to educate my families on, on what I'm doing and what they're thinking. When they're walking in and saying, I want a direct cremation, that affects everyone in our industry. It affects our monument companies, it affects our cemetery, cemeterians, it affects our funeral homes, it affects everybody. And so the bottom line is, is that 
And we're sitting back saying, oh, like they know what a direct cremation is. They seen a sign. They seen a commercial. Direct cremation for $8.95 or $12.95. Or I had a funeral director the other day in Arkansas call me. He, his family owns two traditional funeral homes. He thought he would open up a separate one that was just for cremations. So he went online and started advertising $5.95 cremations if you do it online. Well, guess what? He's up to three or 400 cremations a year already. But he calls me the other day and he says, can you come meet with me? So I go to Arkansas and I meet with him and, and he says, I'm doing a lot of cremations, but I'm not making any money. And I said, the Hayward, uh, hmm, uh, Bert, uh, hmm, uh, can you figure that out, Bert? <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, and so the bottom line is, is that, oh, that was my Bert and Ernie impression, by the way. Uh, the Hayward. Uh, so anyway, so, so anyway, so it's all right to laugh. Some people wouldn't laugh if it hair lift the demon, but it's still okay, okay? Uh, we, can, we can do that, all right? And so even in our business, we can laugh. And so, so anyway, we got passion, remember? Mark just talked about it. Woo! Yes. That's, that's as far as I'm going. If I fall over, somebody help me up. Okay, so anyway, with that being said, you, you know, and so I sat down with him and I said, okay, here's what we've got to do to change this space. And it's not going to happen overnight. And I won't go into all those details, but we started working on a plan to shift it from what he's doing to bringing it toward a more traditional type funeral. But it's going to take time because of how he started it and the seeds that he sown and put in the ground, and it's certainly not going to happen overnight. But here's where I'm going with this, back to something I've continued to say over and over. Where is the leadership in our industry? Where are we who know these things? I mean, it's like preaching to the choir. We can sit and talk about it amongst each other all day. But if those thoughts aren't leading to constructive ideas, and I mentioned to you earlier today when I first began that one of the things I really hope you get from this, if you forgot everything that I said, is that somehow your thoughts were provoked to encourage you to go to the next step in your leadership and go to the next step in making changes and going to the, to the next step maybe for some of you of just acknowledging that change is for real. It is inevitable. You're not going to get away from it. And it will kill us. I said that we're in the best place in our industry to succeed or fail, to live or die. But it's up to us to make the choices to lead the way in educating people on, on what their choices are and what's available to them. I wanna, I wanna share something with you, and I, I won't pass it around the room, but this is a card. I was in a, uh, I was at a restaurant not long ago talking to a marketing guy and I had this card out from a funeral home. I left this card on, my, on the table, went out to the car to leave, and I realized I had left this card on the car. I come back in, and two waitresses were looking at this. They were just looking it over, because at the top, you can see the fireworks display, and then it says, our fireworks displays. And then on the back, it says, fireworks memorials. And so they're looking at it, and their first question to me was, where is the fireworks show at? And I said, at the funeral home. <laughs> they looked at me like a calf looking at a new gate. I don't know if y'all know what that is up here, but, but I tell you what, if you ever seen a calf look at a new gate, whoo, they get lost. You ever seen one look at a glass shiny door? We had one of our country churches put a new shiny door up and the bull just charged right through to the altar. <laughs> Couldn't wait to get there because he seen another bull in the mirror. You know? so, so they were looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate. And not that I'm promoting this, I'm promoting a thought pattern. I want you to understand that. This is a 2,000 call funeral home in Missouri. Their average cremation cell is between eight and $10,000. 
It includes a fireworks display of the ashes, and it includes a picnic. It's called an all-American picnic. Now, am I promoting that? No. I'm kind of like Mark was on the political. I'm not saying do this or don't do that. But what I'm trying to say is, is that we've got to find ways looking into our own communities and, and studying what our communities need and what their thoughts are and finding creative ways to get the messages out to them. I remember a number of years ago, um, we had sold our funeral homes and we were doing some marketing for these funeral homes. And so I get a call from the world's largest funeral corporation. And so they wanted to know how we were out marketing them in one state versus five surrounding states. And so they flew in on their little corporate jet to, and by the way, I don't have one, I fly coach <laughs> and, so, and drive a lot, or ride my Harley. Sometimes I just ship my suits and ride my Harley, by the way. But, but, and I do that quite often. I just come off of a 2,200-mile trip on it. But, but with that being said, uh, you know, they asked me, how are we doing? And I said, well, I named this person's name who was the head of pre-need development for them. And I said, I'm just a dumb country boy. And she looked at me, you know, funny, and I said, I really don't know how to do it any other way than to go into a local community with a local entity, figure out what that person who runs that entity thinks like, and understand what that community thinks like, and then find ways to come up with new ideas. I've never been the kind of marketer that just lays out uh, 10 things for a package deal. I've always been the kind that said, here's 10 ideas, but none of these may work for your community. Nobody knows their businesses like you do, and nobody knows your communities like you do. And I can promise you a couple of things about that. One is, is that while there are many different cultures, and they are, because culture is not just what ethnic background we're from or what country we're from. Culture is where we're raised at. I guarantee you we eat stuff in Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi that you don't eat in Minnesota. And you probably eat things in Minnesota that I don't eat in Texas, Louisiana, or Mississippi. I, I told Don last night, I said, I could never understand how people from the South could ever have been prejudiced. We're a mixture of black, white, green, yellow, monkey, alligator. I mean, you name it. We've got a mixture of everything in our blood. I don't know how we could have ever been prejudiced in the South because we are a mixture of everything. And so my whole point is, is that you understand your communities and your businesses better than anybody ever could. So I'm certainly not here to tell you how to do that. What I'm here to say is, is that with your knowledge and with your leadership of your business and your community, you can take the lead in your community in educating people that can change your bottom line financially. So let's talk about the golden opportunity for a moment and the time that I have left in two different ways. One is how it affects the consumer, and the other is how it affects your business. From a consumer standpoint, without any question, it has a number of benefits to it. But I'm going to give you the summary before I get into those. The summary of it is it simply allows for meaning decisions to, meaningful decisions to be made under the leadership of those who have experience. First and foremost, and above all and beyond, pre-need allows people from an emotional standpoint to start the grieving process much earlier. I don't care what they're pre-arranging. 70, 80 percent of people, and in my world, almost 100, but in a national survey, I think it was 70 or 80 percent, of people that had prearranged any part of their final disposition, whether a funeral, monument, cemetery, or all of it, 70 to 80 percent said that it was much easier at need when there was a pre-need in place. I have three kids, five grandkids, 
My kids are 31, 33, and I'm sorry, 32, 34, and 36. Uh, don't tell them I said that. <laughs> so anyway, with that, because they still think they're five and I'm supposed to celebrate their birthdays like it was when they were five. So anyway, with that being said, uh, I don't want any one of my kids having to make certain final decisions for me. Because I've been on the at need side in the cemetery. I've been on the at need side in the funeral home. I've been on the at seed not seed not with, with monuments. I can tell you there is a difference when something is already taken care of and somebody else is not having to make that decision. I can't tell you how many times I've stood in a funeral home by a casket and somebody looked at me and that family and said, I hope I made the right decision. Well, pre-need eliminates that. So from an emotional standpoint, it takes that part of it out. One last quick story on the emotional side. I, I was in with a fa family friend of mine a number of years ago. She, ha she had cancer, and they had given her six months to live. I get a call from a friend of mine who's a dispatcher at the local police department, and I thought for sure it was because she had died. By the way, almost 20 years later, she's still living. And so it was her husband who was 50 years old at the time, who had nothing wrong with him, who sat down in his chair. She went out and hung the laundry on the clothesline, come back in to make his breakfast, thought he was asleep, and come back to bring it to him, and he was dead. He had died of a heart attack while he was laying there asleep. So I went with her. I drove back from where I was at, picked her up. We went to the funeral home, and we walked in that in that casket room and she fainted. I literally had to pick her up, put her in a chair, and she turned and looked at me and she said, Chris, you knew Rudolph. She said, just go pick what you think would represent him properly. Well, a prearrangement would have solved that. Another thing a prearrangement does is from a financial standpoint, now whether you lock in the cost or you don't, when you're prearranging. I'm not here to promote one of the two. I know funeral directors that do both and, and, and on and on. But regardless, it is a financial arrangement that if you're getting enough growth off of your products and things that you are funding that with, then it definitely offsets the future inflation for your business and for them to not owe any other money. I mean, that's a deal because you're freezing it or at least you're protecting it from inflation. But let me give you a third one, and that's personal choice. So I'm sitting at a, at a home, and I'm, I'm just going to use Marlon as a good example. I'm at Marlon's house, and so I'm, I'm visiting, and we're, we're talking, and I get to the point on pre-deed about emotional. And this guy looks at me, and he says, Chris, I don't give a blank blank about the emotional side of this. He said, I can tell you this. He said, my family has taken advantage of me all of my life. He said, I hope they have a little blank when I die. And he said, so the emotional part doesn't bother me. He looked at me on the money part, and he said, I have no interest in the money part. He said, I can guarantee you that, because he said, they have found a way to spend everything I've ever made. I've got plenty of money. I hope funerals go up 10,000 times when I die so that that way they have less of my money to spend. And I looked at him and I said, gosh, you're a lot like Elvis. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? I said, and I'm not going to sing it to you because I promise you'll be running for the door. But I said, you're a lot like Elvis. You did it your way. He perked up there and put that chest out and he said, you blankety right, I did. And I said, so now you're telling me that the people that you despise most, that you want to give a little bit of emotional blank to, and you don't care about the money part, and you hope it's 10,000 times heavier, you're going to let them make the last choices of how people remember you. They could put you in a pink polka-dotted casket if they choose to. He said, where do I sign? <laughs> and so, so, so the, the point is, is that there is a reason behind it, and it could be all of those reasons, or it could just be one of them, 
But I know that I'm doing a great service for that family when I do that. When I, I feel obligated to talk to everybody that I know about pre-need. Because I mentioned earlier, the Google approach with the consumer is that they're getting enough information to make a decision. I used to tell salespeople this, and I know this is not about only sales, but I'll just throw this tidbit out there. When I'm speaking only in a sales conference, I'll quite often say we kill ourselves in sales because we try to dump all the knowledge on people at one time instead of leading them through a process and making sure we're in a position, in a room, in an atmosphere to where they can understand what we're trying to say, where they can comprehend what we're trying to say, instead of just throwing it all out there and saying, oh, I, 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 you know, you, now you have enough information to make a decision. Make a decision. They don't. I remember when I used to go door to door. I don't know if y'all ever remember that or did that up in this part of the woods, but, you know, we used to, we used to call it paws and jaws. You know, we would go out, and it was the paws on the door and the jaws when people opened the door. I'm Chris Meredith with XYZ Funeral Home or XYZ Cemetery. You know, and anyway, I'd, I'd be talking to the people. And I remember it used to, it was long before cell phones and all that, and they would say, you know, what, you have a brochure. And, of course, I did, but I would look at them, and I would smile, and I'd say, now, Marlon, be honest with me. Are you going to be like me and throw it in the trash, or are you actually going to read it? And they would do exactly what he just did. They would bust out laughing almost every time. And, and the point I'm trying to make is, is that even back then, people were trying to quickly get educated through some sort of something quickly. Not that I'm opposed to that, just like I'm not opposed to the Internet or Google or whatever. What I'm still trying to say is, is we're rushing people through the process or allowing them to be rushed through the process without educating them in the process, and it's because of that that our industry is suffering. I sit in funeral rooms with funeral directors all the time, and, and in those rooms, you know, I'm hearing all the complaints, and then my next question is, is what are we doing to solve it? Are we being reactive only? Are we being proactive? But I, and I'm convinced that we need to allow people to make their own decisions, but we need to be the leaders with our experience and educate people in those things that we do. We need to be leading them in the options they have, not assuming that they know exactly what they want. I almost smile, and if it wasn't for the seriousness of the moment, when I see someone walk into the funeral home and say, I want a direct cremation. I eventually in my career got bold enough to ask them, what does that mean to you? What does a direct cremation mean to you? Well, I just seen it on a sign, or I seen it on a TV commercial, or I seen it here, or I seen it there. Now, there's a few people that know what it means, and that's what they want. But I can promise you that there is a lot more people that say they want something and don't really know what they want because they don't really know what it means. And then we just give them that. I'm asking us to stop for just a moment before I get to the beginning of the beginning of getting ready to close remarks. <laughs> and I want you to just stop for a moment and think about your passion for people. Mark talked about passion. I'm talking about passion. I was with a, funeral direct, a group of funeral directors in Arizona the other day, and we were at the table talking about passion for people. And one of them spoke up and said, I'm not in it for the passion. I'm in it for the money. And I said, well, if you want to start making money instead of losing money, you might ought to get back to having a passion for the people. Sometimes we've just got to rekindle our passion, don't we? Sometimes we need to look back in there and ask ourselves, why are we even doing this? If we're going to contribute our gifts and talents and our purpose in life to affect other people, then we too may need to restore our own passion and determine whether or not do we really want these people's lives to change. And if we do, then let's do something about it. If we really want to impact these people, let's do something about it. I tell our managers, our salespeople, 
our sales force. We've got thousands and thousands of people that represent us nationwide, and I tell them all the time, you lose that passion and you've lost it. If it becomes just money, sure, I love my Harley Davidson. I like the car I drive. I like the house I live in, but does all that really matter to me? Not at the end of the day, because what I do is where I'm at in my heart because I love the people that you and I serve every day. That is my passion. That's never going to change. And if you can't see that in me, I'm sorry. I'm not going to fall down like Mark and have to be helped up, okay? <laughs> I'm joking. But in all seriousness, all seriousness, We've got to understand that more important than anything, it impacts people's lives in more ways than you can ever imagine. I've been thanked many, many more times for educating somebody in this process and leading them through it, even though they spent a little bit more money in the process than I have by people who chose to not go through the process and cut it short. People still need to memorialize the people they love. That will never change because while cultures change, while people change, while technology changes, there are basic human needs that we all have and every single one of us, I don't care where we're from, what country we're from, what color our skin is, it doesn't matter how rich or poor we are, male or female, it doesn't matter. We all have a need to be loved. We all have a need to love. We all have a need to leave a legacy. We all have a need to, to have relationships in our life. And when, when death occurs, I will promise you we're on equal ground. We're on equal ground when death occurs. And every one of us has that basic need. And so we've got to go back to understanding that that is the need that people have. I mean, I'm a Yankee. I'm from a few miles north of New Orleans, Louisiana. <laughs> so, so the Cajuns don't consider me a Cajun because I'm from a little bit further north, you know. So I'm a Yankee compared to them. But I can tell you what, I was in Cajun country last week, and I hate to be political here, but I am an LSU fan, okay? And so I happen to be down there in, in, in LSU territory, and I'm talking to some folks, and we're talking passionate about football, but I can tell you what, at the end of the day, and these were a group of funeral homeowners, at the end of the day, greater than our passion for LSU, our passion for the people that we were serving was evident and how we were going to spread and continue to grow that message throughout South Louisiana. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter where we're from, we all have that passion and, and we all have those needs and we need to be meeting those needs. So lastly, let me kind of begin to wrap this up in the few minutes that I have because I promised you I would not let you be uh, late for lunch, because I'm hungry too. No, <laughs> I'm joking. So uh, all, ser all seriousness, for our business, we talked about what it does for our families, but I'll be quick in this. A, it brings customers. Aren't we in business for customers? I mean, that's revolutionary, right? But pre-need actually brings you customers, and it actually knows that you've got customers on the books. When I get ready to buy a business, I look at what kind of pre-need they have on the books. I look specifically at what's going to come in in future revenue, not what just their revenue is. That's very important to me. So it brings customers. Secondly, and I just mentioned this, it creates revenue and profit. I don't know about you. But yes, passion for people is my number one thing. I could live in that camper by the river that Mark talked about. But I will tell you this, I still have to have profit to have my camper by the river. <laughs> and I still have to have revenue to run my business. And I still have to have revenue to impact my employees' lives as well. I still have to have revenue to do all of those things. So we can't act like profit is not a part of it. I saved this for last because it's not the most important part, but it is a part of it. I'll move on quickly. It increases our market share. I don't know about you, but I believe in increasing market share. Now, I've never done that to the harm of a competitor. Never. Not once and never will. In fact, I've had conversations in this room today of people that actually write for my competitors, and I know them well. In fact, one of the companies 
that's represented, uh, that one of, our, one of the guys here represents, I actually do consulting work for that company and they're a direct competitor of mine. Because I'm of the belief that all of us together, if you put us all together, we're not scratching the surface in our markets. But I will say that I still want to increase pro uh, my market share. I don't know about you, but I like to grow. As I get older, I'm growing in more ways than I like, but I still like to grow, okay? <laughs> and, so, and, I, and so I believe in increasing market share. I, this comes back to something I said earlier, these last two. A, it meets people's needs, and it shows that we care. I mean, wouldn't you appreciate it if you were walking and about to fall into a ditch and somebody came up to you and said, please don't go that way, let's go this way. There's another way around it. Well, of course you would. People want to know. Remember I said people want to love and people want to be loved? People want to know that we care about them in this business, that we're not just some stoic group of people that runs a cemetery, a funeral home, or builds monuments. They want to know that we have a heart for them. So why don't we sell? I've got about seven or eight minutes. So why don't we sell? I'll be quick. Number one, we don't see ourselves as salespeople. Number two, we don't want to appear to be pushy or offensive. And number three, we have no passion. So I already spoke to the passion about going back in and restoring that if we don't have that or even challenging ourselves in it. But I will assure you that I have never seen myself as a salesperson. I used to tell salespeople all the time that I was an 80% closer and I never closed a sale. Meaning eight out of every 10 homes I sat down with a family, I walked away with a sale. But I never was a salesperson. What was your closing? Oh, I'd show it to them, and I'd go to the bathroom. It was called my bathroom clothes. I'd say, do you have a restroom I could borrow? They'd say, yeah. And I'd go, Lord, would you please let them buy? No. <laughs> but no, seriously, it was about educating them. And it was about them knowing I cared enough to let them make their own decisions and not push one certain decision that I favored on them, but at least I cared enough to educate them in it. So we can be as passive as we want to, but we can still be aggressive within that nature because it is our nature. And so we can actually be passive aggressive in what we do. And as far as people thinking you're pushy, think about it like this. If you're pushy, then you shouldn't be. I would fire a pushy salesperson in a heartbeat. But I will tell you this that if we're looking at it in reverse of something I've already said, we care, we're passionate about what we do, we know that they're making uneducated decisions without our experience and we need to bring them that experience to the table, then I don't see that as pushy of me giving you the opportunity to be educated in something that I know you're not. That doesn't mean to me that I'm pushy. So in closing, just a couple of more thoughts. When we see ourselves as professionals, when we see ourselves as consultants, when we see ourselves as counselors, when we see ourselves as educators, and when we see ourselves as guides, so will they. And then in my closing remarks, and this is a whole separate speech within itself, so that's why I saved it for closing. I wrote a quote some time ago that pre-need sets up aftercare and aftercare sets up pre-need and we continue the ongoing of meeting the needs of people from pre-need to aftercare to pre-need. We're continually meeting needs constantly. 50% of our sales comes from aftercare. And aftercare is defined in a lot of ways to a lot of people. I was sitting not long ago with a friend of mine and a friend of Don's who just served as the National Funeral Director Association president a couple of terms ago. 
And we're in his office, and he said, Chris, tell me how you would market me. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> he looked at me funny, and I said, I can lay ten things on the table. But I said, let's talk about a few of them. I said, let's talk about aftercare. And I said, but we all have a different version of what that means. Because even though it's a universal term in our world, it is, it is a misunderstood term in our world. So I said, let's first define what it means to you, then I'll define what it means to me, and then we'll come to an agreement of how that works for both of us. Then I laid out other things like seminars, focus groups, educational things, on and on and on. But nothing in my life when I was in the field, I loved Jaws and Paws, I loved Door to Door, I loved at need. I loved meeting with people at need. I loved all of those things. But being in front of a group of people in a seminar or working with a family after death and just being there for them, and I'll close with this thought, and that is that three days after a funeral, you can't find the people that was at the funeral with an FBI search warrant. <laughs> you can't. That's why at mine, it's specifically laid out. No big visitation, none of that. My son said, why, who works in a funeral home? I said, I don't want people lying to you, son. He said, what do you mean? I said, they're going to walk by, and they're going to look at you, and they're going to tell you how bad they're going to miss me, and they hadn't called me in 40 years. I said, they don't really miss me. <laughs> I said, then they're going to tell you how good I look. I don't look good. I'm dead. The embalmer did a good job. <laughs> and I said, so, so I've got my way of doing it. Uh, but my whole point is, three days after a funeral, everybody's gone. That's when grief really sets in. That's when if that man had a smoke before bedtime at night, that little lady smells it. Or that man opens up the closet door and smells the perfume. On, on, on his wife's clothes. That's when grief sets in. That's when they just need somebody to be there to love on them. Not try to sell them anything, not try to do anything, but just I'm getting chill bumps talking about it, and I mean it, I am. Just sit there and love on them just a little bit. Let them know they care. And I, I'm, I'm too old to care if you know I'm crying or not, okay? <laughs> but just let them know that you love them, that you care about them. You're there for them. That's always led to somebody saying to me, me never selling anything, I need to go ahead and take care of mine so that my family don't have to do that. So yes, I profited from that, but it never was about that. It was all about loving people. So in closing, I'll say this, and I'll turn it back over to Don, and that's this. I told you in the beginning I was getting ready to start getting ready to close, so this is closing. I go back to something that I said in the beginning. What will never change is that people are going to die. But what does change is the people that are dying. And so we need to understand that we are at the greatest point in our industry, it's history, to whether we live or die, fail or succeed. And without any question in my mind, if we understand that people are more educated than ever, but yet without the experience that we offer, the change is inevitable. And if we understand that change needs leadership, then my challenge to us all is to let our thoughts be provoked to we, where we rise to the next levels of leadership. We climb that pole out in the middle of the jungle and say, I see where this can go. And then we come down the pole and find a way to get there. That's my challenge to each of you. Thank you, guys. Only half of you were asleep. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs>